Hello, everybody, and welcome back. This is episode 1515 of the ABM All By Myself podcast. For the first time, listeners, thank you so much. Leave in the comments, how did you hear about this podcast? Were you subscribed and maybe you didn't have that notification bell turned on? Ding dong, which by the way, make sure you turn that on so you're informed every day in real time as these episodes do go live. Because as much as I try to get them on a regimen where every day it's the same time, these are fresh. Every day's a little bit different, so the times do vary. Just a heads up for you first time listeners. For my day ones and everyone in between, you know how we do. Thank you so much for, as always, liking, commenting, subscribing, sharing it with your friends, and uh, just making the world a better place. Sharing is caring. And I can't imagine a better way to care about your friend than to share this podcast with him. So in today's episode, uh, I had a couple fun conversations over the weekend, a lot of memory lane being gone down. And I figured I would talk a little bit about uh, music and things that I've done in music, what I'm currently working on. And uh, the the way we're going to get there is why did I start in the first place? And we're going to start in a weird, uh, a weird, uh, you know, a weird time here. It's not going to feel like it's getting the music but I promise you that it will and it all starts with me skateboarding when I was about 10 years old skateboarding was huge everybody was doing it and uh, I got a skateboard for myself the first couple things I learned how to do was just ride it we lived on a uh, property where there was a pretty big hill where the driveway was going down so I learned how to go down the driveway I learned how to ollie which is pretty much the ability to get all four wheels off of the ground at the same time and uh, yeah, all of my buddies were doing it. Uh, Chris, someone that I shouted out in this last episode and I've talked about because it like my first time smoking, which by the way, uh, again, I went there this past uh, weekend yesterday, a matter of fact, with my buddy Tommy, who is in from out of town, and Chris took care of us. Straw Hat Pizza is not only the best pizza on the planet, but amazing people. Uh, so make sure you go and support. I just wanted to make sure I threw that out because I genuinely appreciate any time someone uh, got me like Chris did yesterday. So it's noteworthy. So yes, so back into skateboarding, and Chris was also growing up the best skateboarder I knew. I was able to ollie, uh, not even up a curb necessarily, but I could ollie over a crack. You know, if I was going fast enough and I caught speed, I could ollie over a crack, but Chris could ollie over a fucking trash can. He could do kick flips, which is the ability to flip the board underneath you higher than I could even ollie. And it wasn't a competition by any means. It was all for fun. But the thing is, when you're a skateboarder, there's a certain level of progression that you must endure to to be the best. And, uh, you know, I felt like I wanted to take that evolution and see how far could I do this. And uh, so I learned how to how to ollie. I believed I could do a 180. I could kickflip on the grass, but I thought maybe my thing could be I'm really good at going off of high things. I'm afraid of heights, so I'm not going to go off anything like 10 feet tall, but you know, maybe a couple stairs here and there, and uh, I'll develop that skill set. Unfortunately, anytime I went off stairs, I just kind of hail married the landing. I didn't take balance into consideration, and 9 out of 10 times, and I'm being generous with myself there, I would land on the board It would just fly out from underneath me and I would either hit my back of my head or the front of my face on the concrete. So I maybe skateboarded for two to three years and realized I'm never going to be great at this. It'll always be something I care about. To this day, I still watch Battle at the Barracks and I love watching the innovation within the sport. Uh, You know, shout out to Rodney Mullen, the godfather, of course, but I still love skateboarding. However, it's nothing that I pursue as I want to get like to be the best at it, right? I don't think it's in the cards for me necessarily. So after skateboarding, I got into BMXing. The people around me, the new house that I lived at, everybody was riding bikes. So I got into BMXing. And it's great. It's a lot easier to get around town on a bike. You can go faster. You can coast down hills without the worry of speed wobbles, hitting a rock and eating shit and scratching your whole leg up. So I liked riding a bike. Uh, I, I But I, I shortly realized that the things that you can do on a bike primarily consist of launching off of a ramp and doing a trick in midair and then landing back on another ramp and the first couple of times I went to a one of them infamously in California uh, we used to ride our bikes down the riverbed to the beach and off of the riverbed people would make dirt jumps 
One of them was called Hidden Hills, and that was the first time I went and I saw dirt jumps. I was excited. I thought, man, this is my time. I really get to progress myself. And uh, I looked at the jumps and I thought, yeah, that's not for me. You know, something about the ability to break my neck uh, on my bike didn't seem too appealing. So I kept it pretty small. I would launch off of curbs. I enjoyed myself. And uh, I always, you know, my first car, I wanted a truck so I could haul my bike around, which my dad told me, Jared, you'll never do that. You're going to get a car and give two shits that you got a bike. Believe me. But uh, I didn't listen, so I did get a truck, ended up not even caring about my bike after that, gave my bike to an employee's son of my dad, and uh, come to find out it was a Haro, which is a collector bike at uh, the point I gave it to him, and it was worth a lot of money, so pretty cool. Pez dispensers didn't pan out, and I kept them. My Haro bike, it was gifted, and it ended up being something that was highly valuable. So I hope the kid still has it. He's probably in his 20s now, but uh, hopefully it's still out there on the road, you know? So yes, so that was my stint with biking. So again, just like skateboarding, I still enjoy it. I still enjoy to watch people ride bikes. I still enjoy to ride bikes with Sandy. I'm just not out there doing backflips and shit because it ain't for me. And it's not that I, you know, I'm a, I, I am afraid actually. Yes, I'm afraid to try a lot of these things, but it just felt like maybe I could put my effort towards something that doesn't have the risk of uh, putting me in a permanent bad injury position. So then what I did is at the time, me, uh, Shane, my mom, we moved in with an uncle of ours, my uncle Gene, shout out to you, uncle Gene. And he was a very musical individual. And, uh, in this house that we lived at, it was pretty funny because it was right off of a main street and it had a pool in the backyard. And we had a slide that actually went up over the fence to the main street. So if you were to get on this slide and you were like me, someone who just can't help, but to show their butt crack anytime they sit down on a slide um your butt crack was up for display like a billboard for the whole town so just a fun memory uh you know just a little quick uh, bonus memory one time i remember me and shane were up at like two in the morning and it was freezing outside and we just got a a wild hair and we thought it would be fun to jump in the pool right now and see what it feels like so me and shane both jumped in the pool immediately jumped out shane threw up and we never did that again so uh, back to the story at hand, though, we had a pool, and next to the pool was a little pool house area. It wasn't decked out to live in necessarily, but it was a large open room, and my uncle put his piano in there, he put a drum set in there, he put his musical, uh, uh, his other equipment like his guitars and his amps, and it really became an area that I became enthralled with. I loved to hear him play the guitar, I thought it was so impressive that he could take this instrument and make music with it. Uh, it sounds like a very common sense thing to say, but it's 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 awesome to watch somebody create music and uh, the drums were what really spoke to me I thought you know I moving my fingers that fast and playing the guitar it kind of hurts a little bit but banging on some drums is a great workout and I just like it right I feel like I have a natural rhythm and it made sense so I started playing the drums and and for, you know, the first probably year, if you're not familiar with drum sets, they have the the toms, which are like the dong, 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 you know, those things that you hit with the drum set on the top. You have a snare drum, which is that loud clap sound. And then you have cymbals and hi-hats and things that make the accents. And then you have a bass drum. And in order to make the bass drum go boom, you have a kick pedal. So you step on it. It goes, uh, it makes this swing arm with a ball in it go forward, hit the bass drum, and it makes a loud thud. So for the first year and a half or so, I didn't even have a bass pedal for the bass drum. So I would just get really focused on hitting all the toms, the snares, trying to figure out beats, and I would just move my foot as if there was a bass pedal. Uh, game changer, I got a bass pedal after that, and it was just a whole new world for me. I remember I watched a DVD called Led Zeppelin. Uh, shit, the song remains the same. I almost forgot, and that would have been bad. The song remains the same. I highly recommend you look it up. And within that concert, the drummer, one of the greatest of all times, his name is John Bonham, does a drum solo during the song Moby Dick, 
Highly recommend you go watch it right now if you're able to after this episode. And uh, it's like 15 minutes or so of just annihilation of a drum set. He's making noises that you can't even figure out how he's doing with only two hands and two feet. And it was so motivating to me that I went out into the pool house. It was probably 4 a.m. at this point and just started banging the shit out of all the drums, trying to figure out the noises he was making, in which my mom walked in and said, Jared, it's 4 in the morning. What the hell are you doing? And uh, I stopped. But from that point on, I was hooked. I just wanted to play music. So I would play with my uncle every now and then. My mom plays piano, so we would play together. But I really wanted to get in a band. I wanted to drum for a band. So I met a few people. And one of them specifically, his name was Danny. Shout out to you, Danny. I know you're out there still, man. I miss you, bro. But uh, Danny was a guitarist. He went to a neighboring high school of mine. So I believe I met him at a party at one point. And uh, we just clicked. And he would come over to my house. He would play guitar. I would play drums. With the first tax return I ever got, I went and I bought a four track. For those of you that don't know, imagine your phone. You could record onto your phone and uh, it's just like one track of audio. But if you were able to record four different times on your phone and overlap all of those things, you could make, just like I guess on an iMovie or on any kind of garage band, you can have multiple tracks, you could layer them. And this gave us the ability to record full songs. So I could play the drums, he could play guitar and bass, and I could do the singing. Because in order to have a rock band or a punk band, you at least need those elements, right? You need a drummer, a bassist, a guitarist, and a singer. Sometimes a singer could be one of the three. But so we would record music. We went under the moniker WFS, which stood for We Fucking Suck. And we put we had a little demo cassette, which for the life of me, I don't know where it is right now. I wish I could find this thing. But we called it our greatest hits. So we had five songs on it. It was our greatest hits. And it was true. These were the only five songs we had ever created. So they were our greatest hits. And uh, one of the things that I, I took the most joy in, I loved playing the drums. And I'm going to actually tell you guys a couple funny drum stories uh, in a couple different you know episodes later on down the road because I do have a few of them. But I love playing the drums. But what really stuck with me the most was the lyric aspect of it. I loved writing lyrics for the songs. I loved, uh, you know, I wasn't a good singer by any means. But we were playing punk music, so it didn't really fucking matter. I loved uh, verbalizing the music. And that was, it became a passion. And I was 16, 17 around this time. All throughout high school, I listened to punk rock. I was a fan of things like Nirvana. I love No Effects, Bad Religion, Pennywise, just to name a few. And uh, around 19 years old, 19 or 20, uh, and this is a time, again, Chris is going to come up again, man. Shout out Capiche Clothing, by the way. Uh, Capiche Clothing, Pizza Boy Fresh, my buddy Chris. But uh, he came, we, we had maybe like four years where we didn't hang out. And then we reconnected around 18, 19 years old. And he was heavily into underground hip hop music. Uh, still to this day, he's a connoisseur of music. But he showed me a song by a group. It was Genelec in Memphis Reigns. The song was called Sun Wheel. And it just blew my fucking ears out of my head. It was, to, to describe it to you, it was the most organic classical music with this backbeat to it that made it feel raw and gritty. And then the, the, the lyrics were like Shakespearean poetry and things that were relevant to me. And it just opened my whole world to this music existing. I had never heard anything like it. And uh, for the first time, I was really motivated to pursue that lyric passion that I had. I had always been writing, but I never really found a lane that I felt comfortable with. It felt like I was kind of faking it a little bit, or I was having to hop on a little bit of a trend to a degree. But underground hip hop gave me a certain originality that uh, just did everything for me. I don't know how else to explain it. So I started writing. Uh, I was probably 25 when I actually re released my first project, which is called I Am Music. Uh, make sure to check it out. I'll, I'll put a link for, for that in the description. I actually do still have to this day, 14 years later, which maybe isn't a good way to pitch something, but I still have physical copies of the CD. I got a bunch of them. I was able to offload quite a bit, but I am selling copies of that CD to this day on the website, letsmindtravel.com. Uh, there's always a link to that in the description. And if you order it and uh, it happens within the next few days, or who cares? How about this? 
order that CD. I'm going to throw in some free shit anyways. I always do. But just so you guys know, anytime you order uh, anything off of the website, I always make sure to hook up some extras, whether it be art, a CD, or what have you. But uh, yeah, check that out. But so lyricism became my passion. I was able to find this avenue. I was able to be abstract with the writing, which I had never heard before. I was able to get political, which I enjoyed, uh, or not political as much as just observant of what's going on in the world and being able to share my opinion on that. And uh, yeah, so I met a bunch of amazing people. I was able to work with a gentleman named ringleader DJ Ace, who worked with Tupac when he was still alive. Rest in peace. He was a Cypress Hills DJ. DJ Sendog from Cypress Hill. He still DJs for, still out there doing it today. He's Ice T's best friend, the one that introduced him to Coco. Uh, you know, he did all of his music for a period of time. I was fortunate enough to be able to work with him. Uh, my good buddy Joe Aztec, Joe Lombardi, he shot a bunch of cool music videos for me. You could check all of those out online. Just look up Upwards. That's uh, my rap alias. And then, uh, yeah, so I worked on that uh, main project, the I Am Music. After that, what I really wanted to do was put something out that reminded me of that first song that Chris had showed me. And to me, it felt it wasn't like underproduced necessarily, but it gave me the feeling that it's highly possible that I'm the only one outside of these musicians that has ever heard this. It felt special. It felt something that was, you know, uh, a secret to most. And I wanted to put out a project like that. So then I put out a project called the DNA Mixtape, and what it consisted of is I would go to somebody's house that wanted to work on a song with me. For like nine of the 12 songs, it was like this. The other three, I just, someone gave me a beat, and I professionally had it record, or I professionally recorded it at a studio. But for the majority of the songs, I would go to somebody's house that also did music. I would... Ask them to show me some beats. And within, you know, a couple hours of a session, I would write, record, they would write, they would record, whether it be that day or another day. And then those are all of the songs that were on that project. And I just wanted to be raw, gritty. Uh, some of my favorite songs I've ever written are on that project. I have one called Wide Awake. That is a uh, it's a song about suicide that I highly recommend you listen to and share with anyone that's going through it. You know, it's I'm not trying to be cocky or anything about it, but I have read comments on that video that says it helped people through a dark time. And, and that's why I do it, you know, and my if it wasn't for me being introduced to underground hip hop and for and it did something to me. Now I could pay it forward and do it for somebody else through my music. That's the fucking goal. Right. So um, but yeah, so I, I did that album and then that was around 2010 and then for the next five or six years it was just sporadic music you know i worked on songs with uh, someone i'd like to recommend is rug rat music he does podcast as well as amazing songs i've had him on a podcast uh maybe a year ago or so on this channel but I've always done music with him over the years. He's one of the people where if he ever asked me to be a part of a project, I'm always down. And uh, to lead you into the current day, it was probably in 2020 when a gentleman, my good friend Bone, uh, he's a musician, one of the most talented lyricists I personally know, uh, told me that he would like to possibly work on a project. So I've been working on that. We're we're calling the project as of right now Roulette. Uh, we have a couple songs done. We talked even today about a music video. And it's not that I'm pursuing music on the heaviest tip necessarily, but I'm putting my energy into projects that I'm passionate about, and I'm excited to see where they go. You know, So Roulette is one of them. Uh, as soon as I have anything to show you guys with that project, I definitely will. And the other project that I'm currently working on with a good buddy of mine, his name is Eddie Booz. Uh, make sure to go check him out. I'll put a link in the description to his website. There's there's going to be a lot of links today, guys. There's going to be a lot of links. Uh, or or maybe not. Maybe I'll just forget. But I, I'll, I'll try to remember. So Eddie Booz and myself make up the group Animal Planet. Uh, we're working on it. It's a total. And we're pretty much done at this point. We're just fine-tuning. And we're conceptualizing releases and music videos. But it's 10 songs. Uh, musically speaking, from a sonic standpoint, it's fusions of a lot of genres that we enjoy. There's folk element, country element, rock and roll element, underground hip hop elements, techno, synth music. Uh, just We just wanted to make something unique and just express topics that we deem to be important. Uh, things that are very conspiratory that you would enjoy. You know, we have songs about drugs. 
or one song specifically about drug use that uh, is one of my favorites. We talk a lot about the government, the elite, specific conspiracies, and what I would like to do for you now, just to give you a taste of it. Now, you can go to the link in the description, animalplanettunes.com. We have a couple of songs that have been released. We do have a music video out for one of them, but you could download two of the songs right now, both of them extremely hard-hitting. A matter of fact, we've done podcast companions for both of those songs, so you can listen to those. You can hear our in-depth analysis of why we wrote what we wrote and what it means to us. And then uh, there's other things coming along with that project that I will tell you as we get closer. But today, I'm going to share a verse with you. And uh, I-, I wanted to talk more about this topic in this episode, but I think I'm going to save it for another time or maybe even a different style of video. But it's called Bezmanov's Steps to Ideological Subversion. I am going to link a interview in the description, but he talks about four steps used to overtake and brainwash a society that go as followed. You demoralize them, you destabilize, you put them into a crisis, and then you normalize. So I'm going to let you just marinate on that for a second. Uh, Look at the link, get more familiar with it, and this is a song, or this is a verse, and I'm not going to do it to the music that we actually made it to, Uh, I'm just going to show you the verse over a beat to kind of make it also feel a little bit like one of our freestyles together, but uh, I just want you to hear the lyrics and get a little bit of a taste for the kind of subject matter that you can enjoy and you you can get deep with if you uh, decide to check out the Animal Planet tunes. So let's do this. I'm going to go ahead and play this beat. It'll drop at some point. See, it's hard. It's hard for me not to get into a freestyle. But uh, yeah, so so uh, listen to this and leave in the comments if you picked up on a few things that I said about Bezmanov's ideological subversion steps. Yo, uh, we gotta let it come back. We got balloons flying over us. Hidden cameras everywhere. Phones are recording us. Lead us down the rabbit hole into the mazes. All put in place to guide us through the phases. It starts off with demoralization. Create mistrust. Manipulate information. Weaken society. Soften the nation. Weaponize intelligence. Mental enslavement. Once we lose balance, destabilization. United we stand so they shake the foundation. All this why they plan a global crisis from underground bunkers and unmapped islands media is used to control the social climate before the conquer it's crucial they divide us infiltrate protests integrate riots but they could only trap us in the cages they provide us and i messed up on that a little bit but i'm not going to redo it uh, i try to get these all done in one shot to make them nice and clean and easy for you but uh, the last line that i kind of goofed was Infiltrate protest, instigate riots, but they can only trap us in the cages they provide us. That's a fucking bar right there, guys. I hope you appreciated that. Again, that is just a sample of the kind of content and the kind of subject matter that you will be hearing on the Animal Planet Tunes. Hopefully that gets you a little bit more excited about the project if you haven't already checked it out. We do appreciate you listening. You can find us on Spotify. You could share our songs in an Instagram story, which is fucking cool. But uh, yeah, guys, on that note, today we went over quite a bit from the 15 minutes. I know I even made like a big deal in the beginning about it being 15 minutes. But hey, like I said, every day is different. Today was a little bit different. I wanted to go a little bit over. Um, Thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Uh, again, make sure to comment. And if you have heard of this whole ideological submersion thing, I want you to tell me your thoughts about it in the comments. Do you believe that it's real? Because it's all speculative. It's all alleged what this gentleman told us. Do you think it's real? Do you think it's happened already? And uh, how do you feel about it in general? And what do you think we can do if it has started to happen to uh, reverse its effects. So guys, not to get too dark, too deep, I do appreciate everybody for listening. Again and again, have a great rest of your day, and God bless.